So with that said, it's a real distinct pleasure to now move us into our first of two plenary sessions. And we really have an amazing uh, leader, an icon. And I know that firsthand because I had the chance to work in Ken's organization for many, many years. Um, we'll really look forward to hearing what's on your mind, Ken. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Stelios, to introduce the, the fireside chat. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. This is um, an incredibly important meeting for many of us in biopharma year in and year out, where we all gather, exchange views and ideas on the current state of affairs. It's usually a very diverse set of topics that we cover, uh, from finance to R&D, innovation, drugs, marketing. Uh, I'm sure this year, with that, in fact, appropriate planning, uh, the COVID conversation is going to dominate pretty much every discussion. I had the pleasure to uh, listen to the earlier panel today, and I did hear many of the things that Ken and I will probably be talking about uh, going forward in this uh, panel. Uh, and in fact, if I could also put a little bit of a commercial here, uh, if anybody has the chance to go back and listen and replay the prior panel, uh, please listen carefully to the to the plea, the passionate and insightful plea by George Yankopoulos on the need to reprioritize and understand what it's like to deal with the upcoming disease burden. And the only way out of that would be to invest multiple amounts, orders of magnitude more than we have to uh, research and development and basic science. So with that behind us, uh, I'll come to the subject today. Uh, it's... Uh, Ken and I have not rehearsed this. The questions are <laughs> unanticipated. They are coming as, uh, as we have the conversation. But I'll begin with uh, something uh, that's in everybody's mind, and that has to do with the current state of affairs. And there are two sort of things I would like uh, to ask Ken about. One is to give us a sense of how Merck is dealing with uh, COVID from the point of view of what R&D programs Merck has in place. Uh, regarding uh, the pandemic. And the second point I'd like to hear about is his views on how we could, should disseminate information from the scientific work we're doing and the social responsibility we have to appropriately inform the public with the right message at the right time, uh, not too soon, not too late, and just be balanced and fair. So with that, Ken, please. So good morning, and thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be in such distinguished company, including you, Stelius. Uh, Merck currently has three uh, announced programs, uh, one antiviral and two vaccine programs. Uh, let me start with the antiviral uh, program, if I could. So we have a, a drug that we call now MK4482. It is a potent ribonucleoside analog that inhibits multiple RNA viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we have two vaccines in early development, uh, hoping uh, to be in humans very soon. Uh, one, V590, uh, is uh, a, a vaccine that is based on uh, our, a vesticular stomatitis virus, a virus that we employed as a platform successfully in our most recent FDA approved vaccine, which is for Ebola virus, which has been highly effective. And you know, in, in field tests, it was nearly 100% effective in a very difficult context in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. The second one, V591, is based on a modified measles virus vector. So we have had a lot of experience, obviously, measles vaccine has been used in billions of people around the world. So, if I could just go back and talk about how we thought about this, and I would say that you haven't heard a lot about Merck's programs, uh, and that is by design, <laughs> uh, not by happenstance. Uh, so the first thing is that my scientific colleagues at Merck felt it was really important for us to invest time understanding this novel virus. So we wanted to spend some time understanding the under underlying biology, how the virus affects the human body, and with that information, we then looked around and said, what are the best uh, vaccine platforms that we could look for? Uh, we have a lot of experience at Merck uh, with, um, with viral vectors that are you know, uh, attenuated viruses. Uh, I mentioned the Ebola vaccine and the, and the measles vaccine. And so we decided to go with those because we think having those kind of replicating virus 
that vector platforms are likely to provide the kind of virus that has certain characteristics. Uh, first of all, we wanted a vaccine that could be administered with a single dose. We thought that was very important when we think about vaccinating the entire world, all 7 billion plus people in the planet. Uh, second, we wanted the kinds of vaccines that could be deployed globally. And, you know, obviously this is an issue that we worry about in the West a lot. In the United States, we talk about it every day because of the impact that the pandemic has had on this country, including the economic freefall that is caused. But you have to realize that as this virus has proven, uh, oceans are no barrier, uh, country borders are no barrier. So we have to think about being able to vaccinate the whole world. So deploying it easily, uh, globally is important. And in order to do that, it has to be administered easy. So we were looking for that product profile in going after the two vaccines that we have. The good news for us is that first patient in will happen momentarily for the measles vaccine. Uh, uh, very soon thereafter for the VSV vaccine. And so we are moving forward. Uh, I will concede that a lot of other uh, companies are ahead of us here, but, but I think it's important to realize, as I said earlier, that this is a novel virus. And many of those companies are employing platforms that themselves are novel platforms that we haven't had a lot of experience, certainly not approved vaccines. Shifting over to uh, the antiviral, uh, what we wanted from a product profile was something that could be orally bioavailable, something that could be orally administered. So we have this and we're very optimistic based on the preclinical data that we have in the early phase two data that we have, uh, that this is perhaps something that would be useful in an outpatient context for people. Uh, obviously it's important with any antiviral uh, to treat the virus as early as possible. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing those uh, pivotal studies, which are starting uh, this month or early next month at the latest. Uh, we have two large pivotal studies, one of which will be in an outpatient context and the other one will be in a hospital context. Shifting to your second question, Stelios, I think your second question is an important one. Um, you know, I, I've been involved in this industry an awful long time, at least for me, going back to the 1970s. And it used to be that the public learned of scientific information through peer-reviewed journals. Uh, it is obviously understandable that given the impact that this pandemic has had on the entire world and particularly on our economy, that every development is something that gets trumpeted uh, to some degree in the media. But I worry a little bit about the public's ability to understand the data that's being talked about. So you'll see almost every day uh, some phase one data being discussed at length uh, on, on network television. Um, and you can tell that people don't understand, for example, the difference between something that is having an immunogenic effect versus being able to confer protection. And even if you confer protection, the question is, do you confer substantial protection? And if you have substantial protection, the question is, how durable is that substantial protection? So people, I think, misunderstand what they're hearing. I know that because a lot of very intelligent friends of mine call me up when they see this data, and I have to explain to them that something that stimulates the immune system doesn't necessarily produce the kind of antibody response that will actually protect people uh, in a significant way from infection. So maybe I've taken too long with your first question. Not at all, not at all. In fact, it isn't just uh, regular people, lay people having a difficult time uh, assessing the success or progress of those trials. Even scientists have a difficult time simply because there's no standard way by which people are measuring what they do. If you incubate something for an hour, you have one effect, the mm -hmm. same incubation for 10 hours, a different binding uh, yeah. uh, result. Uh, when you compare to antibody titers or convalescent plasma samples, given the huge variability of convalescent plasma titers, you know, you could easily have, you know, an inappropriate benchmark against which to compare. So this, this is, it's a very difficult time. And I certainly share with you the need that we need to temper our enthusiasm and, and, the, uh, and the public uh, information that um, we disseminate to the world. Uh, but let me, let me move to another subject, uh, which is equally important, and that is access. Uh, we've seen something 
disturbing, which is the wealthy nations uh, are moving aggressively to secure supplies. Uh, the WHO and others have, uh, in partnership with others, have attempted to create a way, a fund, a mechanism to secure uh, vaccine supplies for developing countries. What is your view on this subject? Well, you know, I have to say that Merck has a long history in this area. Uh, I mentioned that our most recent vaccine is our Ebola virus vaccine. Uh, you don't undertake a program like that for profit reasons. You undertake it because, frankly, the values of the company are that we want to uh, do things that affect grievous illness around the world. Uh, and we felt our vaccine capabilities were ones that we could employ against the Ebola virus. And so we were willing to do that, recognizing that that's clearly something that you make no profit on. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that you want to do because, frankly, it allows you to vindicate what you say you're about as a company. Uh, you know, I fundamentally, if I could take a step back, I don't believe our companies exist to be vehicles for wealth creation primarily. I think they become vehicles for wealth creation uh, if we do what we're here to do, which is uh, to employ science against unmet medical need around the world. And I do stress under around the world. The fact of the matter, as you know, is there are many unappreciated diseases that affect people outside the West, outside wealthy nations. And in this case, this is a tru truly global pandemic. And so to, to get more directly to your question, I think that we as an industry have an obligation to make these products, whether they're therapeutics or vaccines, broadly accessible, and that means affordable around the world. And I think the challenge around distribution, as you just alluded to, is a major one. Uh, we're, as we interact with, with countries, I will say our own country, the US, as well as countries in Europe, um, the challenge is that people want us to secure the first doses for their population. And when you begin to say, well, how would you think about this in a, in a more uh, uh, in, a, in a more objective way, you would say, okay, who needs it most in the world, right? So maybe frontline healthcare workers are the first uh, group that gets them. And then you would start stratifying risk based on people's age, uh, their comorbidities, their vulnerability to this disease. Um, and so I think it's a big challenge when the wealthy nations who can afford the, the vaccine, A, won it first, and B, uh, maybe to some extent are not willing to fund those organizations like Gavi uh, that will ensure that these vaccines get to all the people around the world. And, you know, the reality of the world is it's, this virus has already shown that it's a global virus, as I said before. And to some degree, until all of us are safe, none of us are safe. It will be out there circulating around the world. Uh, you know, we live in a world where there's mass transportation across borders, uh, and that's not going to change. And that's the perfect breeding and spreading ground for a virus like SARS-CoV-2. Absolutely. My, um, my concern is that assuming we have successful vaccines sometime in the next several months, a year or two, and assuming that wealthy nations secure the early supplies, what happens to the less wealthy nations? Are we shutting down borders? Are we completely seizing global trade? Are we making poorer nations even poorer? Than, than what they are. Already nations are shutting down borders. As you know, I just got back from Greece. If you're a US citizen, you may not travel to Greece. They won't accept you because of the high instance rate of COVID in, in, in the US. So Which what is pretty they, ironic in some ways. <laughs> well, they, they, uh, the argument I made with the, with the government in, in, in Greece is they need to appreciate the US is as big as Europe. And what goes on in New York is not the same as Florida or Texas or Wisconsin. And uh, right. They couldn't have sort of like uh, unified rules for the whole country, but uh, thank God I also have a Greek passport, so I can get in and out. <laughs> uh, but actually, on on the issue of access, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Serene is is available. He had uh, posed a question earlier uh, that he'd like an answer to, and I uh, I wonder if uh, the moderators can uh, have Dr. Serene join the call to ask the question. Uh, well, I don't think he's available, but Dr. Vijay Raghavan, who is the principal scientific advisor to the Indian government, might have a related question to this, so, and, and I can see him on the screen, so I'll invite him to uh, pose a question. I can. Uh, it's really um, 
very interesting and valuable listening to your conversation. Um, you know, what has happened over the last decade or so the world over is regulatory processes have become more and more difficult for two kinds of reasons. One, uh, because of genuine stringent scientific requirement, but also sometimes because of the perception that the harder it is to uh, jump over, the more robust the process is. That's a perception issue. Mm -hmm. But the result of such, uh, the latter kind of regulation is that it curbs small uh, uh, industry innovation and it allows only those with deep pockets to jump over the bar. Do you think the pandemic has woken us up to a situation where regulation needs to uh, reboot into a more realistic manner without compromising speed uh, or quality? I certainly hope the answer is yes. Um, I think it's too early to tell, but I agree with what you were saying in the main thrust of your question. I think the world needs much more harmonization of regulatory standards. You know, obviously we want to do global trials, you know, we, for example, have a medicine in Merck called Keytruda, which is useful uh, in a number of different kinds of, uh, of indications in, in, in tumor types across uh, malignant disease. And it's important for us to study it just as it is with this COVID-19 vaccine. We need to study it across borders. We need to study it with different people. We need to understand different ethnic differences in, in those kinds of things. And the challenge is that when you have systems that are not harmonized, that are to some degree opaque, uh, that are to some degree uh, not necessarily uh, focused on what's important to demonstrate fundamentally safety and efficacy, uh, you end up with the situation that you describe. And, uh, you, know, you know, we were very fortunate with our Ebola vaccine to have a lot of cooperation from regulatory bodies uh, around the world. Uh, because if they hadn't moved at hyperspeed and if they hadn't cooperated around the standards, we would never have gotten that vaccine approved. And by the way, to the question of how quickly we could develop a vaccine, that was a fast program, but it took five years from start to finish. And we needed a huge amount of regulatory cooperation across countries. So I agree with your, the premise of your question and I hope we are going to see a change based on this global pandemic. And it's a, it's a it's a good thing you mentioned Kitruda because I do I do see Dr. Serin on, on the screen in his scrubs. He must have just come out of the OR, and he does want to talk about uh, Kitruda and um, uh, what could happen in India. So please, Dr. Serin. Uh, thank you, Stilios, and uh, first uh, admiration and uh, compliments to Karun for continuing this battle over years to connect India and the U.S. and to Ken. Uh, I bring greetings from the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, which is a global university for liver, and salutations to you for the achievements that you have in your uh, tenure in Merck and earlier. I have uh, two related questions, and the first is that will you and how soon drugs like Pembrolizumab shall be made affordable for millions in the low-income countries in line with the Merck's motto, medicine is for the people, not for profit. So that is an excellent question. And I will say that, you know, as the CEO of Merck, that, that expression that medicine is for the people, not for the profit is something that our people do believe in. There are challenges, obviously, we have. So thinking about a medicine like uh, Keytruda, I know that we have tried to launch it in India for non-small cell lung cancer, as well as melanoma. And we have been working with health systems and stakeholders in India to try to make it affordable. We've tried to structure patient access programs in India uh, to make it available uh, for patients paying out of pocket because there is no reimbursement for Keytruda in, in India. Uh, and we have created a situation where we are able to provide free vials, but you asked about millions of patients and uh, we are not meeting the needs of millions of patients this way. 
Uh, we've launched the program in India. We're going to continue to explore alternatives to provide greater access to this medicine because the medicine is actually not truly a breakthrough if people don't get it. So I understand what you're asking, and I totally agree with it. I will also say that I have enormous, enormous respect and admiration for what you do, doctor. Uh, and as we think about researching this medicine for hepatobiliary cancer, we need to think about the Indian population. Dr. Serene, you had a second question. Yes. Uh... Just to continue on the first for 30 seconds, sure. Gilead made hepatitis C cheap for drugs. But my second question is that ILBS, we see close to 900 to 1,000 new primary liver cancers. And I wanted to know, will Merck start collaborating with Indian medical scientists and innovators, such as you know, developing a Merck ILBS immunotherapy program? And if so, I think it's a good idea. I, if you agree, if so, how soon? Okay, well, so again, you're asking the CEO of Merck about something that I wasn't prepared to answer this morning, but I can say generally that I agree with you that scientific exchange and medical collaborations of the type that you were just talking about are critical if we're going to allow ourselves to have impact globally. Uh, and we have to have the right kind of partnerships across early stage disease, uh, to later stage disease, and it obviously has to go from early stage science to clinical stage research. And so I would say to you, while our teams are active around the world, including in India, we've just got to do a better job of having those kinds of collaborations. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. I will tell you that I want the answer to very much to be yes, and we'll just have to find the best ways to create these partnerships. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you spoke before, Ken, about Merck's philosophy about uh, drug discovery, drug development, access, the history of Merck, the culture of Merck. Uh, I'm just going to put a little message here from a time Ammon, who is uh, having a similar conversation later today with Roy Evangelos. He should ask him about the ivermectin story because that was a defining moment for biopharma. For me personally, it was what convinced me I should get into this business. And uh, uh, Roy, again, who's speaking later, has been, you know, the role model for most of us, uh, certainly the Greeks in the industry, and I salute okay. him for that. And well, I'm, I'm not Greek, but very he's close. my role model, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, tell me a little bit, uh, I've got many more questions, but one thing that uh, may come to the surface for good in this uh, pandemic is the fact that we've completely ignored, for a variety of reasons, novel antibiotic research as an industry. What Absolutely. are your thoughts on the matter? So, you know, you, Merck tends to be a company where we say our heritage is our future. So for a very, very long period, for decades and decades, we have been involved in uh, antibiotic research. But the fact of the matter is, as you just alluded to, uh, there isn't much in terms of market-based incentives for companies to do that research. In fact, it's a terrible market to be in. If you discover a new antibiotic, um, it's generally speaking going to be held in reserve uh, for those patients who really need it. The hospital reimbursement codes are such that they discourage the hospitals, even for those patients, for using it uh, because of the bundling, et cetera. Uh, so right now we have a situation where um, there isn't much of a market incentive to do this. And, and I think people tend not to focus on the long term. We're really now focused on SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but for years, we've been trying to urge society to really put in place the kinds of incentives so that we can deal with these antibiotic, uh, these resistant forms of antibiotics. In 2050, more people will die from antibiotic, resistant antibiotic uh, uh, diseases than will die from other things like climate change, which we talk about a whole lot. So I think it's really important for us as a society to provide the kinds of incentives for companies to go after those targets. And by the way, as you know, for SARS-CoV-2, a very substantial number of people who die from that die from opportunistic uh, uh, by, uh, bacterial infections. So the two are linked together, even in SARS-CoV-2, in terms of what causes death here. Um, I think it's really, really important for us to look forward, to realize that the next pandemic could be bacterial in nature. 
uh, and that we need to have this kind of research done and, and not have these small antibiotic companies going bankrupt like we're seeing right now. Well, since you mentioned the issue of lack of market incentives, essentially through pricing and, and, and uh, amount of consumption, uh, that brings up you know, the hugely important question that we've been grappling with for nearly two decades, I would say right now, which is you know, the cost of drugs, attempts by yeah. government politicians to affect change. Uh, many of us would like to see some change as well. There's no doubt about that. What of your, you know, we, 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 we're not being political in these conversations, but at least we can assess the environment around us and venture a guess as to what is likely to happen, whether the most favored nation approaches, executive orders, congressional uh, legislation, congressional decisions. Will anything happen? Or if something happens, what would that be in, in the whole world of uh, drug pricing? Well, I think, first of all, if I could just make a, a comment, I think it's highly ironic that we are talking about a most favored nation executive order in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, uh, like many companies, Merck and others have looked at this with the urgency to invest aggressively and at risk with respect to programs with the goal of having a positive impact on a raging pandemic, which according to NPR yesterday is going to cost the United States $4 trillion this year, right? Uh, the pandemic. And so we're putting up huge costs, including financial and human capital uh, investments, as well as opportunity costs. And it's clear if you look at 200 vaccine programs across the industry, most of these companies will never recoup their investment here. So uh, it is it, to me. It's highly ironic that at this time we're talking about removing all reasonable market-based incentives for R and D in this in in this industry. Uh, I understand the argument, the potent political argument. I've been on the Hill many times. People don't like the fact that in the U.S. we pay more for drugs than people around the world. I think people look at companies, countries like Germany and France, and say. You know, they are, in essence, free riding on the R&D that the U.S. Is, is supporting. I think people miss a couple of other points. I mean, if you look at how much R&D gets located in the U.S., if you look at the quality of the jobs and the wealth creation in the U.S. because of this environment, I think people miss that point. But ultimately, ultimately, I think that the U.S. market is going to be a less robust free pricing market than it is today. I think the trends will continue. The pressure on our pricing will continue. And I worry about uh, how long the capital markets will continue to put substantial amounts of capital at risk for long periods of time to do R&D if they think that the risks are skewed asymmetrically to the negative in the United States. And I think it's coming to be that way. Um, and I think what the thing that I say to politicians about this is that you can do what you want in the short run to make this generation of products more affordable. But we have an obligation, not just to today's patients, but to tomorrow's patients, whose hopes rest on our ability to develop things for Alzheimer's and those kinds of things. And, the, and, a, and a politician who's only running for office every two years, four or six years, they never will know for certain all the cures that won't be developed because of bad policy in the short run. That uh, excellent point, and it brings uh, the discussion to another uh, extremely important challenge of any CEO of a pharma company, small or large, and that is, yes, we all, I'd say all with, with caution, but conviction as well, we all are noble-minded. We do want to do right. We want to improve the condition of humankind. But at the same time, in running Merck, you have another constitu constituency. And in fact, it's a very important one and it's called shareholders. Yes. And in fact, within shareholders, there are those with a relatively short-term outlook and those with a relatively long-term outlook. So how do you balance the mission of a humane company on the one hand with return to shareholders and within that short-term versus long-term? Well, I would say that I've tried not to see the obligation to shareholders and the obligation to our primary uh, constituency, which to me is patients. Patients have to come first. Uh, and if a company doesn't put patients first, 
Uh, it may make money in the short run, but it won't make money in the long run. Uh, so I've always tried to find a way to optimize what's good for patients and what's good for shareholders. I do think the short-term, long-term thing is a big issue. When I first became CEO at the beginning of 2011, it was a really bad time to be a pharma CEO in one, one respect. And that is that a lot of thoughtful people, allegedly thoughtful people on Wall Street had reached a conclusion and a lot of influential pieces were out at that time saying, if you wanna create shareholder value, you ought to cut R&D substantially. Uh, and there were people in the industry who did that. And in fact, you'll remember there were a few companies that basically were anti-R&D and their stocks were flying high at the time. We don't need to mention them, but we, we all know who those who characters they were, right? Uh, and so it was a very hard decision for me when I first became CEO. But I think, you know, you mentioned Roy Vagelos. Uh, I'll, I'll just put a footnote here. I came to work for Roy when I was 38 years old. I was his head of communications. And it was my first two years in the industry were his valedictory two years as he was leaving Merck. And everything that I know about Merck and everything I know about the role of pharmaceutical companies is what I learned from Roy Vagelos. And so I decided very early on that although there was pressure on Merck and we had a five-year uh, roadmap for earnings growth, that I was going to withdraw that. Much to the chagrin of my board and much to the chagrin of my shareholder base, my stock plummeted, uh, especially since, you know, frankly, uh, I started at about the same time as uh, the new CEO of Pfizer did, and they took a slightly different approach. Bottom line is, let me tell you something that I learned and I wasn't smart enough to know at the time. It hurt a lot to watch the stock price decline in the short run. But was, what was interesting is that my shareholder base turned over Stelios. And I ended up getting the kinds of shareholders who wanted to invest in the long term. In fact, I got really the right shareholders for Merck coming in, albeit at a lower price. And they gave us the opportunity, the time to do what we need to do. And I will quote Roy Vagelos here and saying that in order to be successful, a company has to have three things. It needs to have great scientific leadership. And, and there are a lot of great scientific leaders. You talked about George Yankopoulos when we talked about how many great scientific leaders are Greek, yourself, another one. Um, so you need great scientific leadership. You've got to allocate sufficient resources. And then the last thing he always said is you've got to give scientists peace and quiet meaning you've got to allow them to go after their projects without worrying about this year's budget cuts or next year's budget cuts. And we've tried to do that at Merck. And we haven't been totally successful, but I think we created a lot of shareholder value by not giving up on our fundamental principles. Outstanding. And I, uh, let me add a couple of things. Uh, speaking of scientific leaders, I know you've been fortunate to have one of the greatest as your partner in Roger Perlmutter, who is, who is brilliant mind and a great scientist. And I also want to point out something very important, which is uh, you mentioned before that the world would not know how many of these companies that are investing lots of money today won't recoup that money. Merck spent a lot of money on an AIDS vaccine program for many, many years. And that hasn't come to fruition just because that's how science works. Uh, yes. The last point is we're running out of time. The last point I want to, to address is the issue as part of access, but the issue of pricing. I was very encouraged when Albert Burla, the CEO of Pfizer, uh, was interviewed some months ago as Pfizer was embarking you know, onto the COVID vaccine um, programs. They asked him whether he thought there was a good investment, you know, a, a good business proposition. His answer was, we didn't even ask that question. We felt we needed to do it. And we moved on and, and began the program. So. Uh, what is your view on the pricing of vaccines, antibodies, and all treatments in the context of the of the of, of the COVID epidemic? I got a view. I'll save it for a moment later. But I'm just curious to hear uh, whether you see those as profit generators or something different. Well, I think that again, this gets back to the fundamental need to, on the one hand, make our medicines broadly affordable and accessible, but also to run our companies in a way that's economically sustainable. So I will say, uh, you know, for a company like Merck that has put, you know, we're running two vaccine programs and one large antiviral program. We're doing that at risk and we may never recover the capital that we're investing. If those products are successful, 
I think while this is a different model, I think COVID is a different model than the normal model, I still think that we have to be in a position to tell our shareholders that we can make a reasonable profit. We can't go for really high prices in this context, uh, but I do think that at the end of the day, we have to be able to tell shareholders that we're, we're going to provide a fair return on their investment, even in the context of COVID-2. So we will strive for a balance and equitable distribution, as we talked about, across all economic tiers to make the medicine available. But at the same time, I think we have to have reasonable market-based uh, incentives for COVID-19 interventions, uh, including, I would say, those products that have truly differentiated product attributes. We're going to be late, Stelio, compared to some other companies. A lot of people might say, Merck, if you're not going to be one of the first three or four or five vaccines, why are you investing in a vaccine? Well, the reality of the world, as you know, Stelios, is there are different populations that are going to have different needs. There will be an endemic phase after the pandemic phase. And the first vaccines may not be ideal vaccines. So what Merck has said is we're going to proceed trying to develop the kind of product profile that I talked about, including a single dose vaccine one that has very high levels of efficacy and safety. And I think if we're gonna to continue to do that and we're gonna to have to put up the billions of dollars necessary to develop that, we have to be able to get a return on that. But that does not mean maximizing our profitability. I couldn't agree with you more, Ken. I mean, the, the way I look at it, this is a global health crisis, an economic crisis, a social crisis. We are the first responders in this crisis. Yes. And as yes. first responders, we have added responsibility besides what we've done to our shareholders. And, and, and again, I'll say, Stelios, I mean, if you think about what the world is going to spend in terms of the trillions of dollars that are not just on the direct medical cost, but the cost of propping up their, uh, their economies, uh, the idea that you know, somehow pharmaceutical companies should do this for free doesn't make any sense in that context. If we're able to bring forward medicine that actually reduces direct medical costs and provides those broader societal benefits around economies, et cetera. I think it's the kind of thing that there should be a reasonable return. Agreed. We ran a couple of minutes over time, but this was uh, a conversation we couldn't stop. I wanna thank Ken, our uh, participants from India. Uh, it's been a wonderful chat. Uh, a reminder to the, to the audience, as we go into the next phase, there will be questions and scroll, scroll, scroll down to the bottom of the page uh, to take the poll to the questions presented. Again, thank you, everybody. And thank Arun for uh, being with us once again in this wonderful meeting. Thank you.